Hey friends, Pastor Jeffrey here, and I come to you on a Friday, and it's fall, and the leaves outside are turning, and the air is crisp and cool, and uh, I've just been in the office all day, been trying to get things set for Sunday, and we're going to talk about one of the scriptures here in a few moments, but I wanted to make sure that if you're watching this, uh, if you look back on uh, either my Facebook or YouTube, you're going to find a, a couple cool videos that I did this week. One is myself singing um, O Thou in Whose Presence, which is an unfamiliar hymn, but we're going to sing it in worship this Sunday. And I sung it in uh, four-part harmony, and that was fun. And then I had uh, my daughter and I sat down and spoke with that about it this morning. And uh, so if you would enjoy watching my cute daughter, I always do. Um, but you're welcome to, to watch that and maybe learn a thing or two. Um, if you're connected to either of my fellowships, um, I have a couple things coming up. One is if you uh, are connected to the Delaware Church, we're having a Sunday morning potluck uh, breakfast, of course. Do not bring dinner food uh, at 8 a.m. And then we're also going to have our 4 o'clock board meeting. It's a monthly board meeting, so if there's any anything that you think we should be talking about, then bring that to the board or let Hubert know he's our board chair. Um, also, the No Water Church is having a board meeting on Tuesday evening at 6.30 p.m., so if there's something you want to make sure the No Water Church talks about, take that to, to Carl Gibson. He's the board chair. And then finally, it's not church-related at all, but it's health-related. Um, the No Water Can uh, 5K run is a week from tomorrow, eight days away. Um, so if you enjoy 5K runs and you think you would uh, enjoy this one, then then go sign up. They have a, a website registration. I would uh, I thought it'd be good to talk about just a, a small section of the, the scriptures that we're going to be looking at on Sunday. It's Phil, uh, Philippians chapter 4. This is uh, a largely positive letter that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, and, and the section we're covering on Sunday deals with um, Eudoia and Syndicate both having house churches and not getting along together, so he's He's pleading with them to get along. Um, but then he has just general exhortations, and they're aimed at peace. Uh, peace, the the Greek word is irene. It's where we get the word Irene, the name Irene. And uh, it's an absence of violence. And, of course, we believe that uh, Christ is coming one day to bring his kingdom of peace that will be instituted after the violent realms of this world are ended. Um, but even so, we find ourselves needing this peace uh, well, even here and now, and we're afforded this peace, not just when the kingdom comes, not just when Christ comes, but we're afforded this peace now. And, and as I've said from the pulpit many times, as I've gone into the jail and, and ministered to, to men and women that are behind bars, after about a year of doing that, I came to realize that the innermost yearning of all of these people is peace. Um, it just became abundantly clear as they talked about their anxieties, as they talked about justifying how they had done, and um, that it, it was just pretty clear that their innermost hunger, their innermost yearning, was for peace in this life. Um, so, yeah, with that in mind, let's, let's read. We're going to start in uh, chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, there's a first reference, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When it says it transcends understanding, I believe that means it doesn't make sense. You can't understand it from the outside. It, it only happens to you once you've followed these steps. Verse 8, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace, there it is again, will be with you. So I'm a, I'm a pastor of, uh, I think I'm more confrontational than most. 
because I think it, we need to be put in a decision point pretty frequently about who we're going to be in this life, and if we're going to be with Christ or if we're going to be with the world. And if you've read your Bible, you know that you can't really ride that fence. you got to be on one side or the other. Now, just because you're on the wrong side yesterday doesn't mean you can't be on the right side today, but even so, there are sides. And wisdom lies in being able to discern those sides, right and wrong, good, bad, light, dark. And you find a lot of that language throughout the Bible, but especially coming out of the mouth of Jesus, whom Christians say we follow. Now, here we had a scripture that's aiming us at peace, a lack of violence, a lack of anxiety. And it says straight up, don't be anxious about anything. But, let's see, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Uh, with prayer, no, with, uh, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. How do you do that? Prayer. Prayer through the Holy Spirit. And if you pray in the Spirit, you present your requests to God, He will take those anxieties from you. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, uh, transcends all understanding, uh, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So, um, I remember there was a young lady in my high school who was a believer, she was up front about it with everybody, and she always seemed to be happy. And she just wouldn't participate in gossip, she would never get nasty. If people got nasty around her, she would just walk away. And I remember I really didn't like her very much because I was a worldly and And to, to me, she seemed subhuman. She seemed like she wasn't fully human. And one of the things Christians believe about Christ is that he was fully human. If, if anyone was ever fully human, it was the Word of God made flesh. Um, so what did Jesus not do? Jesus didn't sin. Um, he didn't have sex. Um, he didn't participate in the desires of the flesh at all. So these things that we look at as essential for, you know, there's a lot more than three. There are a lot of things we look at as essential for being human that lead to anxiety, that lead to violence and a lack of peace that actually are not at all essential for being human. Christ, uh, the Word, the eternal Word of God, becoming flesh made an argument about who we're created to be and, and um, well, what the good life is. And so if you've read much history or philosophy, the two interact, a lot of conversation is what is the good life? What does the good life look like? Our, our society right now has given up on that question, and we're kind of eating ourselves alive now because what you're left with if you, if you give up on that question is the answer, well, whatever feels good to you. And of course, what feels good to humans is self-destruction because we are born in sin and we're prone towards entropy and chaos and nastiness. And so that's what you see when you look at our political setting. You, you see a bunch of people no longer pursuing the good life in Christ they're pursuing the good life as it pertains to what seems right in their own eyes. And so they're devouring one another. They're, it's, it's depressing to watch. And Christians can't save the whole world. Uh, the real question is, can Christians be saved? You know, uh, When Christ comes on earth, will he find anyone who belongs to him? That's the real question, and, and uh, the answer uh, for me, at least, is as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And there has to be this radical insistence on the part of anyone who follows God that I don't care if the world thinks I am less than human. I don't care if sinners think I am not living a good life by not participating in sin. Um, I've, I've in recent years come to admire people. Um, I remember when Breaking Bad was the biggest show on television and there were believers who just say, uh, I don't need that. I don't need that in my life. I remember when Game of Thrones was big on TV, and a lot of believers said, I don't need that. I remember when Big Brother was big on TV, and a lot of believers said, no, that's, that's, no, I, we don't need that in my life. I remember visiting with a gal in Idaho one time. We were talking about horror movies, and she said, I never watch horror movies. Why would I let the devil in? You know, and I'm talking about media consumption right now, but in all facets of our lives, we make daily decisions about what we let in and what we keep away. And what if we establish this lens of whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, praiseworthy, excellent or praiseworthy. These are all great descriptors that everybody would love, but what if we 
hold everything to that standard. And if it doesn't meet any of those standards, we just say, no, I, I can't have anything to do with that. I have nothing to say about that. What if, what if being holy, what if being God's people means that we just say no to some things and that's the end of it? And when other people keep talking, I mean, that's their prerogative, but, but do we really need to talk back? Do we really need to have something to say about everything? Do we really need to participate in evil to know that it's evil? At a certain point, one would realize how ridiculous this is. It is not a coincidence that, that our society mocks truth. We don't talk about the truth. We talk about your truth. It's no coincidence that our society doesn't care about what's noble. Nobility is something that's scoffed at. Whatever is right has become completely subjective. Uh, what's right in my eyes might not be the, what's right in yours. Whatever is pure, we mock purity. There are a lot of people who think that Jesus doesn't even care about purity. That's a ridiculous notion. Purity is absolutely a, a very high scriptural concern. You go down the list, each of these virtues lifted up here in scripture has been systematically demolished by the world. So, I've done my weekly tirade. Here's my weekly exhortation. Be fully human the way Christ was fully human. Lift up those virtues in your life as a lens for how you yourself should live. Lift those things up for the people that you love. And do your part to actively create the world that you're living in. Right now, a lot of stuff is falling apart. As peacemakers, we bring things together in Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Bye, friends. See you Sunday.